This has probably been the longest presidential election season ever. And I'm looking forward to Election Day and finally casting my vote. I'm registered. I receive a card in the mail prior to Election Day reminding me where I vote and the hours the polling place is open. Pretty straightforward, right? Well, for many in this country, it's not so easy. A recent New York Times editorial states, the discouraging fact is citizens in 17 states will find new voting restrictions in place this year. Obstacles that include stringent photo ID requirements, limits on early voting, and unjust hurdles in the registration process. Since the Supreme Court's 2013 decision in Shelby struck down Section 5, or a pre-clearance statute requiring all states and election bodies to request permission from the Justice Department before it imposes voting changes or restrictions, the only tool to combat those restrictions now is litigation. The lawyers at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law are mighty busy these days. But Tomas Lopez, counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, where his work focuses on voting rights and elections, is here with us today. Prior to joining the Brennan Center, Tomas was a fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center's Immigrant Justice Project, where he worked on litigation and advocacy challenging anti-immigrant legislation in Alabama. Prior to that, he served as the Bacon Immigration Law and Policy Program Fellow at the University of Arizona Rogers College of Law. He's a graduate of Duke University and Yale Law School. I'm Alice Bloom. This is A Town and Village Two. Tomas, thank you so much for being here tonight. I know this is a very busy time for you. Let's start by talking about ID, photo ID requirements. We show IDs all the time. If you want to cash a check, sometimes even to use your credit card to enter a building in Manhattan, you have to show an ID. What's the big deal about showing an ID to vote? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> You're we're welcome. I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, obviously this is a busy time. And uh, you know, we don't, one of the things that is important to us at the Brennan Center is to make sure that uh, the public is educated about what's going on around voting rights, around the election. And the question you raise about ID is a pretty important one. Uh, when you ask what's the big deal about ID, uh, you know, one thing that's important to note is that uh, there is a difference between simply having to prove who you say you are uh, and the kinds of ID requirements that we're starting to see in some states around the country. Okay. Well, is it a problem if they say, just show me your driver's license? So, for instance, you know, we have a federal law that mm -hmm. says that when you register to vote, uh, you have to meet some kind of minimum standard for um, proving who you say you are. Okay. But in a state like Texas, where they have uh, what we would call a strict photo ID law, it's not just about showing ID. It's about showing a specific form of ID. Hmm. So in that state, for instance, you can use a driver's license, which uh, we found that many people don't necessarily have, and that kind of gets to the issue. Um, but there are other things on that list, but it can be quite limited. For instance, in Texas, as the law was written, uh, you could use a concealed handgun permit at the polls to vote, but not a student ID. Okay, and a student ID issued by a university, perhaps a government That's right. run organization. Not, accept, not, not, accept. not accepted as the law was written. What's the motivation for having it so specific? You know, one of the things that, that we try to put forward when we talk about these ID laws is to say, uh, number one, uh, we're talking about the kind of ID that not necessarily everyone has. It's not necessarily that half the public doesn't have it, but we have research that shows around 10, 11 percent of folks don't necessarily have the kinds of photo ID that are required under some of these restrictive laws. So is there a motivation behind having a voter ID with so many sure. restrictions on it? Sure. I mean, one of the things that we talk about is that this is less about the integrity of the election system, and we think it's more about manipulating the system. Okay. Now. We can talk candidly. I mean, I've done extensive research about this and certainly read lots of articles about it. And the consensus is that these are machinations that are usually developed by one party to suppress voting by voters in the other party. Uh, 
and usually it's the Republican Party that is trying to suppress votes by people who are likely to vote Democratic. Is that your, your experience as well? One of the things that we've seen, for instance, you know, we looked at uh, the 20 plus states that since 2010 uh, have passed some kind of law that made mm -hmm. voting more difficult, whether that, those were photo ID requirements, whether those were reductions to popular things like early voting, uh, barriers to the voter registration process. And what we found was a great majority of the states that passed these restrictions were number one, under the control of a single party, um, and two, it tended to be uh, under Republican control. You know, at the same time, uh, I think it's important for people to know that voting really shouldn't be about politics. At least our voting laws shouldn't be about politics. Uh, and so what we don't want to do is to say, look, this is a Republican law, this is a Democratic law, this is an issue that affects one party, that, that you know, affects another. Um, we're concerned about voters. You know, you raised Texas earlier. Right. Um, you know, a federal court found that there were 600,000 registered voters, not just eligible, but registered voters, who did not have the kind of ID required under that law. When you and have a group, and when you have a group that big, you're talking about people who come from, who have a range of political views. And okay, but was that group? Are you able to profile that group? Were there particular characteristics of that group? Sure. I mean, one thing that we know about uh, voters who tend to lack the kind of ID that's required under these laws is that tend to be members of racial minority groups, mm -hmm. African Americans, Latinos. Um, we also see that um, the elderly uh, are is a population that uh, sometimes doesn't have the kind of ID that mm -hmm. is required, uh, and young voters as well. Okay. One of the arguments in favor of voter ID is to suppress voter fraud. In your experience, have you found voter fraud to be a serious problem? What the research shows is that the kind of fraud that voter ID purports to address is vanishingly rare. Um, there's a study out of Loyola Law School mm -hmm. from a couple of years ago that looked at all the ballots cast between 2000 and 2012. And what it found was that of the billion plus ballots that were cast, it found about 31 or so potential cases of voter impersonation fraud. That doesn't sound statistically significant. I think that that's right. Okay. So that claim is bogus. Right. I mean, at the same time, you know, we want people to understand, number one, uh, that the ID laws that are in place in these places uh, can be, are quite restrictive, that there are voters who do not have them, and number two, um, that we're not just complaining about these laws. I mean, we're actually trying to work to fight them, fight a number of them in court. Right, by litigation, as I said in my opening. Now, I also mentioned pre-clearance. Now, that was a revelation to me. I didn't know that exists. Sure. Let's talk about that for a moment. Sure. So, uh, folks may have heard of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, this was passed in 1965. Uh, we just had the 50th anniversary of it last year. Uh, it's one of the hallmark achievements of the Civil Rights Movement. And what the Voting Rights Act is, it's a federal law that prohibits discrimination in voting practices. Um, it has a number of provisions to it, um, not just discrimination on the basis of race, but also national origin. It prevents language discrimination. Um, there is a piece of Section 5, as written, that called Section 5, as you identified in the VRA. What it says is, if you are a jurisdiction that has a history of discriminatory voting laws, then if you want to have your voting laws changed in some way, move your polling place, pass a photo ID law, uh, really the, the, the gamut, then in order for that to go into effect, it needs to be approved either by a three-judge panel or by the Department of Justice. Okay. And about how many applications before Shelby did the Justice Department or the panel receive? They would deal with these, I mean, just very many. We're talking about thousands of jurisdictions in the country who deal with, um, who deal with elections because elect our election laws are mainly decentralized. They're at the state level. Each They're at state the local makes its level. own rules. That's right. Oftentimes a county will be in charge of certain things, where your polling place is. Uh, what a particular procedure can be. Okay. And so Section 5 covered uh, some states entirely, 
but parts of other states. So, for instance, here in New York, uh, the city of New York, the five boroughs, were covered under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Okay. So this was a, an obstacle to an obstacle, to the creation of obstacles. What was the thinking of the Supreme Court when it struck down Section 5? So the important thing about Section 5 was that it allowed us to stop bad voting laws before they went into effect because it created this situation where somebody in the process, whether it was the three-judge three panel or the Department of Justice, was saying, hold on a second, what effect is this going to have? Okay. Is this going to have a discriminatory impact? The Shelby County versus Holder case uh, was a 2013 Supreme Court decision where the court said the formula that the law uses to determine who has to abide by this requirement is out of date. You know, we disagree with that outcome. We think it effectively gutted um, this really critical protection that we have. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said in a dissenting opinion, um, getting rid of Section 5 is like throwing out your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm. Hmm. Uh, part of the majority's logic was that uh, because it seemed that instances of voting discrimination, discriminatory laws had decreased over the years, that the need for Section 5 had abated. Okay. I think Justice Roberts had said, oh, the, the reasons for Section 5 no longer exist. Right. In your opinion, do they still exist? I think what we've seen since the Shelby County decision, the wave of restrictive voting laws, including in some of the very places covered by Section 5, uh, shows that we need the protections um, of the Voting Rights Act. And there is legislation uh, that Congress can pass that would actually uh, bring back some of that accountability. Okay. So that was definitely a blow to voting rights, the restriction, the lifting of the of Section 5. Let's talk about other restrictions that are imposed on sure. people's ability to vote. Moving polling places. Sure. One of the things about polling places is, um, again, this is something you're talking about election law being decentralized. Polling places are typically uh, set at a very local level, a county or a town, depending on... Uh, most of us here, and I think most people listening to us in our, our listening area will say, well, the polling place is a couple of blocks from my house. It's on my way to the train sure. station or whatever. Not inconvenient. Right. Polling place locations, though, can definitely be more convenient for some and much less convenient for others. Mm -hmm. One example I'll give you from the uh, 2014 election cycle. There was, big, there was a controversy in uh, North Carolina over uh, whether or not the location of a polling place uh, at a university in Boone, North Carolina, Appalachian State, and uh, a feeling that a number of people had uh, that was eventually you know, kind of settled down um, over whether this was so inconvenient to students and was being placed in a way to try to discourage students from voting. Um, where voting takes place can have an impact, especially when you're talking about people who don't necessarily have access to transportation. Which was, not only transportation, which was the state that located polling places in municipal buildings right next to police stations? We're talking about, uh, there was Athens, Georgia in the 2014 cycle had a proposal in place okay. to have people vote in, uh, vote in or next to police buildings. And I think that was construed as somewhat intimidating. That's right. To some people who might not be comfortable going to the police station. All right, that moving polling places, shortening or canceling early voting periods. Now here in New York, we don't have early voting uh, unless absentee ballots. Of course, you can sure. you can file your absentee ballot ahead of time. Um, how does that restrict voting? So early voting is one of the most popular election reforms we have in the United States. We have many states that have adopted some form of early voting. Uh, that is the opportunity to go in person to vote before election day. We find that it has a lot of positive benefits, not just for voters, but actually for election administrators themselves. That it can reduce long lines, that it can help make elections more manageable, um, and that it's quite popular with voters. Uh, unfortunately, I give you uh, there are, are a couple of examples of places that in recent years uh, have reduced early voting. Uh, one example is North Carolina. North Carolina passed a law in 2013, right after the Shelby County decision that included not just reductions to early voting, but a photo ID law, uh, the elimination of same-day registration, the elimination of pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. And what early voting does, what reducing early voting does, is uh, take away literally the opportunity to cast a ballot. Um, 
What we have seen in some places is in particular that some forms of early voting are especially popular with African American voters. Uh, there are places that do what some people call souls to the polls drives. Sort of on Sundays, people come from their church. Mm -hmm. They go to the polling place. This year, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals held that, Nor that North Carolina could not enforce its law in this election. So that ID law is in place and the early voting has been largely restored. Okay. But there's been a great argument at the county level in North Carolina about what the hours of early voting look like and what are the specific kind of contours of what's that, what that's going to look so like So the now. efforts to restrict or to create more obstacles don't end, even though you think that by restoring early voting, you think that you've overcome the obstacle, but yet there are other ways to restrict it. Let's talk about some other ways, just so people have a, a broader view sure, of all sure. of the, the ways voting can be restricted, uh, uh, restricted. Requiring proof of citizenship or a photo ID to register to vote. That's Why right. is that a bad thing? So I think you, you can imagine a voter registration drive. Mm -hmm. uh, you imagine someone from an organization like the League of Women Voters mm -hmm. um, in the public place uh, registering people to vote, and they say, uh, excuse me, sir or madam, would you like to register to vote? They say, sure. And they say, okay, um, do you have your birth certificate or your passport with you? Uh, and what we have seen is actually in the state of Kansas, uh, you need certain documentary proof of citizenship in order to vote, and that not even a driver's license counts. And yet, most y you cannot get a driver's license unless you're a citizen, at least in New York. I know that's the case. The laws are different in different in states, states. And, and but what we've seen in Kansas is that uh, they've maintained a list of voters who have submitted voter registration applications, uh, but who uh, did did not provide this documentary proof. Mm -hmm. Between the beginning of that law going in effect at the beginning of 2013 and uh, the end of 2015, there were about 35,000 people on that list. That's pretty significant. All right, how about erroneously purging voters from the list? Now, this happened in Brooklyn, I think, last right, election right, cycle. Right. How does that happen? Now, one of the things that's important to know is that uh, maintaining a voter list is something that every election administrator does. Uh, it's an important part of making sure that our election systems work the way that they're supposed to. Um, but they have to be done carefully. They have to be done well ahead of an election. Mm -hmm. And they have to be done in a way that makes sure that people don't end up losing their right to vote. I mean, what we saw in Brooklyn you know, earlier this year appears to have been a case where uh, the proper procedures weren't followed, um, and unfortunately people ended up having difficulties at the polls. We've seen in some states, too, in previous election cycles that uh, states will purport to uh, purge voters and in particular try to seek to purge uh, non-citizens, and what they'll end up doing is ensnaring a lot of citizens in that process, making their, voter, uh, making their election process much more difficult, uh, and yeah. What's a voter to do? If you show up and you voted all your life and suddenly you're not listed, what do you do? You know, the minimum thing, the bare minimum thing that you know, people can do is, number one, um, you always have an opportunity to vote a provisional ballot. Okay. Now, the challenge with provisional ballots is that in different states, there are different procedures as far as whether or not that gets counted. You mm -hmm. know, when you're actually at the polls and you're being told that you're not on the list, one of the things a voter can do is try to insist, hey, let me uh, call the main office, see if I'm on the list there. Uh, the Brennan Center is a part of a big effort with other voting rights groups called Election Protection. We run a hotline that's active on Election Day and through much of the election season called 866-OUR-VOTE. And that's 866-OUR-VOTE. Like, that's right. Okay, so in New York City. Yep. Is that only for New York that City? That is the entire, all 50 states. All 50 states. So if you should have difficulty when you go to the poll yeah. and you know you're a registered voter, yeah. you call that number. 866-OUR-VOTE. Okay, we're going to try to get a graphic up with that, That'd but we'll do our best if we can. Gerrymand gerrymandering districts to dilute the power of minority voters. Now that's another strategy employed to obstruct voting. Redistricting presents real challenges. Um, you know, I think... Uh, if folks haven't seen what a map of their uh, congressional or legislative district looks like, um, they might find an interesting experience to take a look to see mm -hmm. the way it's drawn. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that 
Uh, sometimes they are drawn in ways that end up diluting the power of minority voters, and also sometimes are drawn in a way to try to bolster the party, the power of whatever political party is in power to draw the lines. Gerrymandering is a whole is a topic we could devote a whole hour to, but since we don't have the time, I want to talk more about voting restrictions and voters' rights. Straight ticket voting. I had never heard of that before, but yeah. that was uh, a problem in Michigan where straight ticket voting was permitted. What is straight ticket voting? Straight ticket voting is uh, the ability for a voter to, when they have a ballot, uh, you know, imagine a ballot mm -hmm. where uh, there are columns mm -hmm. and all of the uh, candidates from a pl particular political party are listed in the same column. Okay, so you could cast one vote right. and say, I vote for the whole slate. Right. Now that's, now that's something, now that's an issue, well, I'll be honest, that we're not especially active on. Okay. But one thing that is related that is worth noting is that uh, one is the design of ballots. Uh, ah, remember 2000. Right. And the Florida hanging chest. Butterfly. Chest, right. Yes. The butterfly yes. ballot. I love to tell this story. My mother was then a, a resident of Palm Beach County, I guess it was, yep. and she called me and said, I think I voted for Buchanan, and I didn't want to. I said, how could she? This yeah. is a woman who's been voting for, yeah. at the time, 80 years. Yeah. And it was then when the news broke that a lot of people were confused by the design of that ballot. I realized yeah. she was correct. Yeah. And so uh, straight t so a ballot can be construed. Do we have straight ticket balloting in New York? I have. You, you know, in New York, uh, you don't actually have to check. Yeah, I don't yeah. remember ever seeing that or being able to cast one vote. Yeah, you could go down a line yeah, and, and vote actually, for everyone. I'm not positive in New York so whether or not that's why a, would. What is the advantage of straight ticket? I mean, it's one check mark instead yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the argument in favor of straight ticket voting is that it's a convenience. Okay, so who would take... Who was being disadvantaged? Is it... I mean, everybody? I mean, anybody could use it. Right, I mean, I think... You okay. know, I'm not very familiar with the arguments against straight ticket voting, so I wouldn't want to speak okay. directly to it. Lazy people. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think I think some people may feel that maybe it makes the, the process too simple, but I wouldn't want to... We want to go there, in folks but miles. in any case, in some states where that's allowed, that has been used as an yeah. obstruction to voting. Um, do you think there's a trend in state legislatures towards bills that expand voting access? We have seen a lot of uh, positive movement in recent mm -hmm. years as well. Uh, we have a number of states that have chosen to modernize our okay. election system, okay. and in particular, the reform we're very excited about is automatic voter ah, registration. My you, we are, you're clairvoyant. That was going to be my next question. Automatic registration of voters. How yes. will that work? So we actually have this now in a number of states. Uh, it was passed by uh, California, Oregon, Vermont, West mm -hmm. Virginia, uh, being implemented elsewhere as well. The idea is uh, that when you go to your Department of Motor Vehicles, to get a driver's license, renew a driver's license, mm -hmm. uh, you are registered to vote unless you opt out. Okay. So we have a federal law now that, that says, you know, you have to be offered the opportunity to, but that's an opt-in. And by changing that presumption from uh, you're not going to register to vote to you're automatically registered to vote unless you decline, then that ends up signing up many more voters. We have 50 million unregistered voters in the United States. 50 people who, 50 million people who could vote, who simply haven't been registered. That's right. And do you have any sense of why they don't register to vote? There are many reasons. Just, you know, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, one component of a fully modern registration mm -hmm. system is voter registration that moves with you. You okay. know, there are a lot of places where you could move around the corner and you have to register to vote all over again. Right, right. Well, isn't that the case in New York? I mean, you, you must, read, unless you go back to your home polling place and sure. just cast your vote sure. there. Sure, and you know, there are many places where uh, your voter registration doesn't move with you. You're so busy dealing with everything else in your life uh, that you know, the bureaucracy of voting um, isn't something that occurs to you until election day, at which point it may be too late, which is why something like election day registration is also something sense. that we consider important to that. Now, in New York State, we don't have Election Day registration. That's you have right. to pre-register. Do you know what the date is for the last day to register? October 14th is okay. the voter registration deadline in New York State. In New York. So if you are not registered to vote and you see the show before October 14th, hustle. Um, if you have a New York driver's license, you can do it online. You can? Yes. Okay. Is New York one of the few states that allows you to do it online, or are we just following somebody else's tail? But online voter <laughs> registration has been a popular reform. Uh, okay. And so there are we many do. states that have it, not all yet, 
Uh, and it is an issue, though, where, where New York has managed to move forward. And there could stand to be more election reforms in the state, but uh, New York should be pleased to have at least some form of online voter registration. Now, in my research for this, I realized that so many people do not have or have had their voting rights abridged because they've, create, they've uh, been convicted of a crime. That's right. So if you are indicted, do you lose your right to vote if you have not been convicted? So generally what the law is, is, and this is dependent on the state, mm -hmm. but uh, we have uh, felony disenfranchisement laws in the United States that okay. take effect upon a conviction. Okay. Uh, there are about six million Americans who are unable to vote because of a past felony conviction. About 4.4 million of those people are people who are no longer incarcerated. They are living and working in the community, deemed to walk the streets but not to walk into a voting booth. So they've served their time, they have been freed, and they still cannot regain their right to vote. These are individuals, some of whom have completed their sentence, some of whom are serving parole or probation, but all living among us. Uh, we have a patchwork of laws in the United States on this. New York is a place where individuals serving a sentence of probation can vote, but those serving a sentence of parole cannot. We have three states, Florida, Iowa, and Kentucky, where there is a lifetime ban on voting if you have a felony conviction. Wow. Is there any effort to overturn that or to modify that? I can tell you that we have been a part of efforts in a number of places. Uh, there is a ballot initiative that is gaining some steam in Florida for a future election. Uh, you know, there just this year, uh, the governor of Virginia has, um, has vowed to restore voting rights to thousands of people. Uh, and we were also part of a successful effort in Maryland that uh, passed legislation, enacted legislation, that gave the right to vote to 40,000 people who are living and working in the community. How many people would you say in this country have had their voting rights restricted? Total. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a hard, you know, I'll be honest, I, I wouldn't want to put a number on it. You know, what we know is that uh, we always say that one vote lost is a big issue. Um, we do have some numbers, you know, we look at Texas and the amount of people, like I mentioned, the 600,000 mm -hmm. there who are estimated for uh, not having the kind of ID that, as that law was written. Now there's been a different solution for this election, and so those individuals should be able to right. vote. Well, I'm just going to tell you in my research, and I'll have to find the citation for you, I found that six million people had had their rights restricted. I wish we had more time to talk. In the minute, in the less than a minute we have left, how do you think voting ID requirements and restrictions are going to affect the coming presidential election? One of the things we know is that uh, obviously there's great interest in the election. Uh, I wouldn't want to judge how it affects outcomes, but we do know that there is litigation going on in a number of states that are also states that are competitive for one reason or another in various races uh, where uh, voting restrictions have been at issue. One is North Carolina, where the restrictions aren't going to be in effect. Another is Wisconsin, where the uh, ID law is going to be in effect. Another is Ohio, where there's been a great deal of um, talk back and forth about uh, the length of the early voting period. And so those are just a few of the states that should be watched. It looked to me like the Brennan Center has been pretty successful in its challenges. We have had a, we and our allies in the voting rights space have had a good run recently. We've had positive, we and our allies, other folks that have worked on cases like this have had victories in Texas, of which we were a part, um, in Kansas, uh, of which we are a part of an effort. Friends in North Carolina have had a success. Um, we have been able to stem some of this tide, but folks should know and should be aware that even after Election Day, uh, some of these cases are going to continue. Uh, the Supreme Court is, uh, will very likely take up some of these issues in the next term. Um, and uh, so this isn't the end of the story. Okay. Well, we look forward to talking with you again. I thank you for your hard work on behalf of voting rights. Thank you. And I know that it's made a difference. Tomas, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. I know you're on your way to Washington for <laughs> further hearings. It's a very busy time for you. We'll be talking with you again after the election. Great. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you at home for watching. I'm Alice Bloom. We'll see you next time.